Hey everybody, it's your girl Queenie. Welcome back to another Bar Talks podcast. I am still continuing my uh, discussion with great people talking about those that have inspired them to their greatness. And today I am honored and excited to be talking to Mr. Talong AC. Um, he is, I, I, I want to say he's from Baltimore, but he's out there in the West Coast now. Um, he's an amazing artist, uh, he's a scholar, and he uh, has amazing perspectives. Over the years, I've been able to follow him, and I'm excited to have this conversation with Mr. Talam Macy. So welcome, Talam, to the Bar Talks Podcast. Thank you. Thank you, um, Queenie. I'm from um, New Jersey. Okay. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I lived in Baltimore for about a decade, and it was a great time. I had <laughs> great experiences with beautiful people. Yeah. But I am, uh, I'm from New Jersey, born and raised. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you for that. I, I, I knew that there was a connection with Baltimore um, because I met you here on the East Coast and you were, if, I'm, if I recall, you were living in the Baltimore area at the time. Yeah, for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so you're out on the um, West Coast now, right? Yeah, I'm in, in Los Angeles. I'm in, a, um, I'm in LA County in Redondo Beach. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. Well, thank you for, um, you know, we share two different time zones. So I appreciate yeah. you, uh, <laughs> you joining me today. And uh, especially during a time like this. So I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, as I shared with you earlier, I have been working on this um, series of recordings. And I've been blessed to talk to people from all walks of life, from all areas in the world thus far. And we've just been talking about that greatness, that, that thing that drives you and where you got it from. Um, so I will ask you, uh, who has inspired you to the greatness that I've seen and many see in you? Um, yeah, who inspires you? My biggest inspiration would be my mother. She... Um, taught me, well, she, she didn't teach me to read, but she encouraged me to read at an early age. Mm -hmm. So I was reading from uh, like either late into my three, third year or early into my fourth. Um, there were plenty of books around the house. Mm -hmm. She offered me plenty of, of conversation. Uh, when I had something to talk about, she wasn't the type, she still isn't the type of person who would entertain uh, just, uh, we call it small talk. Mm -hmm. right? You need to have something in mind. So if I were talking about something I read in a book or I had a question about something that was going on in life, that she would take me to the library, you know, which is something that's not completely necessary in this day and age. But back yeah. then it was a big deal, you know, going yeah. through card catalogs with her and, and helping me write reports and things like that. She was involved in computer science at, at, from my beginning. So long before there were personal computers or even computers with keyboards with letters on them, she was involved in, in programming. Mm -hmm. So she was programming like COBOL and, and, and those sorts of languages. And um, she's been, you know, throughout my life, she's, she's been someone I can ask questions, mm -hmm. uh, always has very prescient and informed answers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would, I would say my mother, I don't know if I'm supposed to go out and, and if I was supposed to reach out to someone and say like uh, some historical figure, no. well, I, didn't know, I didn't know those people. I mean, I've read, <laughs> read their books, you know, yeah. Yeah. but I didn't know them the way I know my mother. <laughs> and uh, she's been a guide throughout, you know, from, from the beginning up until the present day. Wow. Yeah, no, you, you know, listen, um, we gather our inspiration from all places and a lot of it started at home. So to say your mother, there, it, 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 it makes sense to me, you know, that's right. the person that planted those seeds and, and, and they inspire you. Um, my son told me the same thing <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was impressed that that was his view of me. Um, but it made me really think about, you know, the life that I'm living in front of him even more. So your mother, that's beautiful. All yeah. right. So um, you have something else to add to that or I can move on? 
Yeah, I'd certainly move on. <laughs> I, I, I can add to that. If, if you want me to speak on my mother for 15 minutes, I can do it. <laughs> but yeah, if you have I more. I think I heard, if I'm not mistaken, I remember hearing a poem about your mother. Yeah, the five women. I talk about my um, my great great grandmother who was um, Sally Gist, and then I talk about my great my great grandmother who was um, who is uh, Galveston McNeil, and I talk about my grandmother who was Eula English, and my mother Jacqueline Ac, and my father's mother who was Flora Ac. Yeah, I talk about all five. It's called Five Women. It's, yeah. Nina Nina Simone had a song called Four Women. Yeah. Women. So five women. Yeah, I, I was blessed to actually hear you perform that live before. So I knew that you had okay. spoke about your mother in a poem. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I, have, I have two other questions that I've asked every person that I've interviewed during this time. But uh, I also add in a couple of questions. So um, sure. to know that your mom is your greatest one of your, well, probably your greatest life inspiration. Um, and I want to know, uh, because you're an amazing artist as well, um, I want to know if there is any one or thing that inspired, um, the, or that inspires you, or inspired you to become a poet, or that inspires you on that journey of poetry, because you are a spoken word artist. Um, what inspired you? Because you know, people that are going to hear this may not know you, but I do. And I know how you can rock a room. <laughs> so uh, where, where does that come from within you? You know, I grew up with it. So in addition to all of the books that we had around the house, there were a lot of records. And the records that I played most frequently were those, uh, I would play the Oscar Brown Jr., Brother, Where Are You? I would play Gil Scott Heron and Brian Jackson's um, Winter in America. I would play a Madness by the Last Poets, right? and I would play them over and over and over again. I, I almost brainwashed myself, I think, from <laughs> a young age all the way into my teens, playing those same records. Mm -hmm. And um, when, when Jessica Care Moore did the Apollo and she was slamming, well not slamming, I'm sorry, she was doing the Apollo was Showtime at the Apollo competing with spoken word mm -hmm. and kind of revived something in me. So to jump all the way back, keep in mind my mother and father were in a Mary Baraka's organization, a community for a unified North. So poetry mm -hmm. had always been a part of my, my life, mm -hmm. uh, African arts, African culture. And going, we would go to plays, and and you know we we saw Timbuktu, you know when Eartha Kitt was in it, yeah. and so on and so forth. And you fast forward that uh, by the time I was eight nine years old, Rappers Delight had come out, and you know hip hop was just starting to become popular, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just learning about uh, Melly Mel and and Grandmaster uh, Kaz and 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 these you know all these cats, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, cool Modi, right? So I'm learning about all of that, and I, I get into that uh, end of it because I have been brought up off of, of poetry. Yeah. And then when Jessica, you know, fast forward back to Jessica at the Apollo, it was like, oh, I could do it the way I learned it originally, yeah. you know, the way that I had been listening to it my entire life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that changed it. And then when I found out about, so then go forward a couple of more years. Love Jones comes out, right? Yeah. And I liked it, but I didn't like it. It was a little corny to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> kind of Will Smithish. And not that yeah, he's yeah, a corny yeah. dude, <laughs> but he ain't Wu Tang, you know what I mean? Yeah, he yeah, ain't yeah, like yeah, yeah. Rakim, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it was it wasn't dark enough, you know, for mm -hmm. me. Uh and but the a combination of of seeing Jessica do her thing for the Apollo and, and seeing the um Love Jones kind of brought me into a poetry venue uh, that a friend of mine was running. Uh, probably, you know, a lot of poetry venues sprung up around the country based on Love Jones, you know, in the black mm -hmm. community. A yeah. lot of those open mics came from that. because they were trying to capture that vibe. Yeah. So my, a friend of mine was running one. I was, I didn't want to be in, you know, I was into hanging out at bars and lounges. I didn't want to just, but it was, his thing was like that. At Bogies, mm -hmm. it was a combination of, of that Love Jones vibe, but it was also that grimy, 
you know, it was almost like a, you know, uh, you better watch, watch what you say up in yeah. there. You know, yeah. <laughs> can't be bumping into people and stepping <laughs> on people's feet. You know, it was like that. You know, um, and, and from there, I got into the slam movement. So a lot of the slam poets from New York would come over and perform at our open mic because, in our mind, they were the professionals. Mm -hmm. So they would come over to perform in Jersey at the open mic and um eventually we started going over there and slamming mm -hmm. you know and and when and the slam in new york uh between doing the slam scene and the open mic scene in new york it meant i could be performing in harlem at the national black theater uh, on 125th and 5th and and then turn around and be in brooklyn on atlantic avenue and then uh or flatbush avenue at the brooklyn moon or turn around and um or was that Nordstrom? I think that was not. It was off of Flatbush. It was Nordstrom, and and then turn around and then go to the Bowery, which was a very famous uh, punk rock place. Mm -hmm. um, they had the uh, what was it? CBGBs. Right? It was a very okay. famous punk rock place. It's where a lot of that you know like Ramones and Blondie and all of them uh, yeah. came out of. So, yeah. but they had a poetry spot in the basement of there. I mean, you could be anywhere. Then you'd be in the Lower East Side of the New York weekend. Yeah. You know, 236, I think it was East Third between A and B. I think that was the address. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it you it so I was exposed to a lot of different types, but then that National Poetry Slam introduced me to poets all over the country yeah. and some around the world. And I started, you know, collecting phone numbers and email addresses and, and networking with them and then traveling uh first down the East Coast, then from then we went to, you know, I went to Texas, uh, mm -hmm. me and the cat I was performing with back in that time called Faraji. And sorry for this long answer. No, no, <laughs> I, I love it. We, I love it. <laughs> we, we drove, I, see, in the beginning, when I, first, when I first got into slam, people were at, like libraries and things were having slams and it would, you could win like $50 and $100, you know? Yeah. And I was doing the pool chart thing. So I would be <laughs> online looking up places that had these little slams where they expected people from their local community to come in and compete. And here I am like really heavy in yes. the New York scene in Brooklyn and Harlem and, and Jersey. And um, so I'm, go I'm going over, I'm, I'm like, yo, was this place in Pennsylvania or this place in Connecticut or this place in, you know, they having a little, you know, and that's how I even first went to Baltimore. I, you know, mm -hmm. I saw online that, that they had a library, you know, Pratt was having a slam, a poetry slam. So I, I go down there, you know, I'd sit there like, you know, really unassuming in the yeah. back and, you know, <laughs> and don't say anything. And everybody's like, oh, this guy is going to be a pushover. And then I get on stage and here you have this person who's been, um, you know, uh, tuning his chops in the New York, New Jersey, spoken word area, you know, winning slams and everything. So I was getting money like that, like just mm -hmm. traveling around getting money. So it got down to as far as like DC, you know, DC area. Yes. And then eventually I took a ride uh, to across the country. Um, I set mm -hmm. it up online, emails and stuff. And I went from Jersey all the way to Texas, drove. Right. And then um, came back and did New Orleans and did, you know, so we did venues all the way down there, me and Faraji, and then venues all the way back to Jersey. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing to do was to fly to uh, California. So we started out in Northern California doing Oakland, San Francisco and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then eventually down to L.A. and so on and so forth. And, and next thing you know, we're traveling around the country. And in Texas, one of the things I did was an international poetry festival called the International, the Austin International Poetry Festival. And then you meet people from all over. So I ended up be you know, meeting people who were running poetry festivals in Germany, poetry festivals in London. Mm -hmm. You know, so I then I moved to travel internationally, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. before you know it, I had been in Germany. I've been in, in England, in the UK more times, and I don't even know. I, I seriously yeah. do not know how many times I've been to the UK, uh, been to uh, Austria, so on and so forth, right? Uh, yeah. Ended up in uh, doing poems in, in uh, Amsterdam, right? Oh. In, in Holland. So I've done poems in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, The Hague, you know, yeah. all of that. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. I, you know, I... I... I think about when I met you in the in your on your journey. Um, you're right. You walk in. I remember the first time I ever met you right here in the DC area. You were just this cool, tall, slim brother with a hat on his head, and you were just chilling. And I think you always wore a jacket or something, you know, or you know, button up shirt and <laughs> you know. Um, 
But when you got on that stage, Talam, you know, your poetry made people like myself feel something different. Um, you know, you talked about ancestors. And when you did, I'll never forget it, when you, when you did a poem and you're speaking about ancestors. And by the way, I still have your CDs. I still <laughs> to this day. I still have some of your CDs. I used to play them for my son and now um, now he's trying to be a rapper but I played your poetry for my son because I hoped that would have been the route he would have taken. <laughs> but um, I just remember listening to you and your poetry, your words were different. Just different. And I began to follow you because I was just like this man. And there were so many people just like you. That, and I mean, it's just like you mean speaking consciousness and right. waking up things inside of me, that activist that's inside of me, that, that person that believed in change and education and, you know, believed in the Black plight. And all these things came from just listening to some of the poet poems that I heard you share. And people would really be in awe because we had so many different artists come before you in a in a venue and then 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 there you come and in that moment when you would speak it was like really nothing else mattered anybody else to perform because you really would bring it so hard <laughs> so as i'm hearing this story i'm like that's why that felt that way when i met you the first time there at one of the poetry slams because you were that person that was nothing like anything that i was listening to prior to you taking the stage yeah, that, that was intentional. I, I used to want to be as unassuming as possible. And I thought it was part of the impact. It, it was, and, it was. And I, I never wanted to walk in the spot. <laughs> There's a joke. I even have a thing on Instagram, a little video where I talk about that. Where I just, I never wanted to be the feature, right? I never wanted to walk in, you know, with the crazy outfit, some platform <laughs> shoes, you know what I mean? Some glitter <laughs> on my face, you know? You know, some big giant sunglasses. I never wanted to be that guy that as soon as he walked in the door, people were like, oh, we, we must be the feature. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, we used to crack no. that joke all the time. We used to say that when somebody walked in looking crazy, like, oh, I think that's the feature. Right, right, right. No, <laughs> no. We no, wanted to have... walk in. And, and it's partially a Jersey thing, right? And, and yeah. Where I came up and then the time I came up, you didn't want to stand out. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to stand out, you know, whatever made you stand out, they was going to relieve you of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. 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 No. It, would cause, it would cause you problems. Right. Like, that was one of the. That was one of the fascinating things about uh, when I really started hanging in New York, uh, to me because. The cats in New York would be flossy and they were weird, like the same way rappers dressed, and 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 of course the early rappers came out of New York. So seeing mm -hmm. the cats, the way rappers dressed with gold chains and, and the flashy clothes and everything, people in New York actually would wear that stuff and go to mm -hmm. parties like that. So and so, mm -hmm. like in Jersey, not so much. You know what I mean? Like if you 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 couldn't get far with no gold chain, people that's mm -hmm. rent for somebody. <laughs> you right? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't gonna work out for you unless you know you had you were as a known a known of force in yeah. the area other than that mm -mm. <laughs> that's real <laughs> all right so let's move on so listen uh, my next question to you is um what's one of the most rewarding things that you've learned in your life that you can share with me today um <laughs> One of the things my mother always wanted me to understand was that the, the, the importance of saving. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, throughout my entire life, I just never got it. And um, it is very important. So she gave me books like um, The Richest Man in Babylon. She gave me books like, uh, well, I, I stumbled upon The Alchemist myself. But you know, the, she, she really wanted me to save. She really did a lot from the time I was in my younger teens throughout my life to try to convince me to save, and I never could. I save now, you know. Okay. Uh, I wish I had started saving uh, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, 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 the message that, that brought me to the other side was the understanding that people are comfortable with a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. and if they look in their pocket or in their bank account and there's more than that they tend to spend it mm -hmm. so if you put the money someplace else 
you know, uh, if you invest it or you put it in, in some type of a savings account that you don't touch, whatever, because I have, I have multiple like bank accounts and investment accounts and, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And I, I place things in pockets because that's what works in, with my, my psyche, right? Mm-hmm. To, to place things in different, and then I don't touch it because apparently the minute something becomes too big, if you're not used to having large sums, you become uncomfortable and you look for ways to spend it. Wow. So a lot of, I, I used to wonder about that when you go to people's <clears> houses and it's a million knickknacks <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, if they never bought all of this stuff, they could, you know, have a whole nother life right now. They could, <laughs> they invested all this money. They could be sitting, you know, maybe they'd have tons of money in the bank or tons of money in the market, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I think if you're used to, getting by and, and if having a few extra hundred dollars at the end of the week is what's comfortable for you, then when you find yourself with a few thousand extra dollars, you eventually find ways to get rid of it. Yeah. You got to so, spend yeah, down. You have to spend right. down so, because you're more comfortable at that hundred dollars exactly. versus a th- thousand mean I can still spend. Right. Yeah. So I, when, I, when I learned that and I heard someone tell me, I mean, just to throw a number out there, it was a, you know, I remember someone who was doing okay, just like anyone else. And they were telling me that, that I, you know, if you don't have, they just throw the number out, let's say 10 grand in the bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, how could you feel comfortable? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, wow, you have, at the time I was like, yeah, yeah what? In the bank? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what you have, what was, just sitting there like, you know, right. you, you, get right. another car, you know? Right, right, right. And then having heard that, I started hearing other things like that opened up my mind. And then I was in, I'd be in the banks and then I really hear conversations that must've been going on my whole life, but I never paid attention yeah. to. And you hear the guy in front of you talk about, all right, well, I need you to move 70,000 from my uh, checking account mm-hmm. to my savings. I need to move 120,000 from my money market into, you know, this uh, checking account too. And mm-hmm. you're like, what? Right. Yes. <laughs> like what yes. am I doing? I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so a, a lot of that. So that those were um, an impetus to kind of change the way I move. Yeah. Those things. Yeah, that's an eye opener when you start hearing people say these large amount of money l- amounts of money. They just want you to just toss it over here, or you, they they're gonna pull it out because something has happened and it's there. And you're like, you right. just got fifty thousand dollars just to slide what? Right. What am I doing I, wrong? I had, a, <laughs> I had a friend back in the days, and I, I couldn't speak his language clearly. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and there's been a couple of those instances where people were just, they were operating. They say when a student is ready, the teacher will appear. Sometimes you ain't ready. And, you know, so, yeah. you know, so people have come to me and they were operating at levels that I didn't understand. So I had a friend, for instance, who had a, um, who had, he had two beauty salons in, in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Fresh, two or three. Mm-hmm. He had a clothing store. Uh, and I remember I was at the time I was a council, a business consultant and I didn't have a lot of savings myself. You know, I mean, when we made money, we kind of spent it. We had all, it was, we had a fresh offers, you know, but we didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> and I, I was trying to get him to take a business loan, right? Cause I, I got a certain percentage from different banks on, on helping people get loans and things. And, um, he wouldn't do it. And he, he laughed at me and said to him, man, I got my own bank. And I, wow. I didn't understand what he meant, but I know now, you know, <laughs> like I know what it is now to uh, need to to want to take a loan, and the person that you have to convince is you. Yeah. Wow. You don't have to sit down at some, you know, you don't. If it's a certain amount, if it's of a certain amount, you don't have to go down, you know, and sit down in some office and and try to convince somebody else. You you know, you have your own little mini bank. And mm-hmm. if you need that loan, you just need to convince yourself. Yeah. Give yourself permission. <laughs> Cut right. out the middleman. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a good lesson to to learn. And I hope that um I hope that the listeners, especially the young people, I hope they get it now because we, you know, we didn't get it till we were older. And so some of us are playing catch up, you know, because cause we didn't get it. So I, I hope they're listening to you and they're getting it now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Too. Yeah. So um, the last question that I have for you that uh, relates to this series of inspiration is, 
you know, right now we're talking, of course, in the middle of a pandemic. And to date this show, we are also talking in the middle of everything that's going on with our cities burning and people angry. Um, Justifiably, they're angry for many reasons. But um, we're talking in the midst of all of that. And so by the time folks hear this, um, it'll be at least a month from now, or yeah, about a month from now. So we don't know who's going to listen to it and where they're going to be at in their life. But I'm asking that you share something with us that, you know, maybe um, is on your heart to share that maybe someone can use um, along their journey, no matter where they find themselves at, um, whether it's um, wisdom, a word, a message, a thought. Uh, I would just like for you to to leave that with us so that in the future, when they open up this time capsule, this is what they'll find. All right, um, quickly, I would say if you're older or younger, if you haven't read uh, The Richest Man in Babylon or, or The Alchemist or, um, and, and How to Win Friends and Influence People and Think and Grow Rich and Think and Grow Rich and Black Choice, if, no matter what your age is, I, I think it would behoove you to read those, those books. Uh, and if you're younger, not, I'm not giving investment advice, but if I were like 12 right now or 13 <laughs> or even 16, 17, if I had, if, you know, I had some money given to me like in a birthday or that I saved up, I probably would put it like in a mutual fund, something like VOO or SPY, which are just S&P indexes and just leave it and forget about it until I was older, you know, um, and that's not investment advice. I'm just saying not this invented. is what I would do. Yeah. And um, in general, uh, for your, your listeners, assuming that they're around our age range, the most important thing that I do and that I would also recommend to others of, of our group is I think it's a good idea when you wake up in the morning to think about what if when you wake up in the morning, if you have a job, you find out that you were fired. If you have a business, you find out that it's been shut down. The question is, what do you do now, right? Because if you can think, if you can figure out what you would do if you got fired from your job or if you lost your business, you will put yourself in a much better position to handle adversity down the road. And if you don't think about it, of course, you know, until that happens, it's too late. So think about that now. When you wake up in the morning, think about if I find out, if I were to find out this morning, and, and every morning, think that. What would I wish I had done? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I find out my business got shut down overnight, what would I wish I had done to prepare myself you know, for a plan B? Mm -hmm. So th that would be my advice to people because that's what I think about all the time. It'll drive you crazy and you're not going to come up. You, you, you may never come up with a clear answer, mm -hmm. but I promise you that you, you'll come up with a couple of steps. You, you'll do some things differently. You know, you, you might move some money from here to there. Mm -hmm. uh, that you would not ordinarily have because in that frame of reference, you're not comfortable anymore. Yeah. You know, if you're comfortable, you may let that money sit there or you might continue spending on this, that, and the other. But if you put yourself in that uncomfortable frame where you be like, I better do this now because if that becomes the reality a week from now or a month from now, I would like to know that at least for the last week, at least for the last month, at least for the last six months, I, I was doing these moves mm -hmm. to pre prepare for a plan B. And you, it may not be perfect by the time you know uh, the other foot drops, but you'll be better off than had you than you would be had you not done anything. Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's good. I love it. You make me think about some things a little differently, as always. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Talam, um, I would like to know: uh, Are you working on anything new? Uh, I see that you and um, your Significant other or spouse? I'm not really sure, but I, the video yeah. was beautiful. Uh, yeah, we got married. Uh, yeah, we got married on uh, seven six. I'm sorry, seven sixteen sixteen. Yeah. Oh my God! Con well, congratulations. So the idea was seven seven seven. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I see that um, the two of you make beautiful videos together. I love mm. watching the energy. Um, so uh, is there anything new that you're working on? Do you have any projects going? Um, yeah, what you have going on? Again, because you, you are, I know you're more than just an 
just a spoken word artist, but you are a hell of a spoken word artist. So what are you doing? What do you, what do you have going on? Um, sp spoken word wise, I just put out a book called Premeditated Karma. And you, mm -hmm. can, you can pick that up. You can go to karmapoet.com. And the reason for the whole karma poet thing is funny. It's because of the book, of course. Uh, that's where the karma part comes. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Talam AC, people have so much, have, have had so hard of a time spelling my name. It's four A's in Talam AC. And people don't know where they go. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> to yeah. simplify it, because you can also go to talamac.com. It'll get you to the same spot. But just okay. to simplify it, if you go to karmapoet.com, K-A-R-M-A-P-O-E-T.com, you can, uh, you can, see all the videos that we've been working on, like the ones you mentioned. Yeah. You can see uh, the book. I have done some some other writing. I'm more concerned now, back in the days, I knew exactly, I had less resources and more yeah. ideas. Oh. Now I've got like way more resources and fewer ideas of what to do. So yeah. I can always write. Like even these videos, I can make those videos go you know, forever, you know, yeah. for years, for decades. I can, I can uh -huh. always do something. But I'm not, I guess it's the traveling. I think when I traveled more and I was always yeah. in a venue, it mm -hmm. was easy to get the pulse of what people wanted from me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you saw what was selling off the table. Yeah, you saw what other people were selling off their table. Mm -hmm. So you kind of knew where to go next. Mm -hmm. But I'm not that close anymore. I don't I venture out as much. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, 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 my biggest question with regard to spoken word really is what people, I want to know what people want to see from me because mm -hmm. I can do whatever. I can put out vinyl. I could mm -hmm. put out another book, you know, I could put out another, um, you know, more audio, but it, the question is, what do people want to see? And it, it's, I was up three o'clock this morning thinking about how we used to sell these CDs for 10 and $20 that mm -hmm. didn't cost us much to make, you know, and now you can get a thousand plays on certain certain platforms and you get 10 cents yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a little per, different isn't per it? thousand plays you know so yeah. it's not really encouraged it doesn't make it doesn't really motivate you to hit the studio yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah, yeah. No pun intended or intended right. play. Or intended play. <laughs> but um i want to know what people want to see from me i know that there's something and i have the resources and ability to do anything now mm -hmm. i just don't always know where it is I should be doing. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that, Talam, um, and I cannot speak for the masses of your fans, but uh, many of them, I believe, many of us, we want to see the Talam that we've always known. We miss him. We miss that. We miss that presence. We miss your words. We miss the rhythm. We miss the music. We miss the drums. <laughs> we miss the pauses. We miss all of that. <laughs> so um, when, and when I see you uh, maybe post one of your older um, videos, I say, oh, this sometimes like forever ago, right? But one of the older videos, I'm like, oh my God, I miss this, you know, and I'll play it over and again. Um, that I miss. And if I could, you know, if, if I could play you in my house in present day, speak in present day poetry and just let it pump through the speakers, that's what I would do. Yeah. I mean, and it works. And I, and I, some of the stuff that I posted is, is not that old, right? Some of the stuff yeah. is within I have posted things that were at, at, like in the last year, some of the things I posted, I posted like a month or two after I had yeah. just recorded it, you know? Wow. Um, but in terms of a business model, it, from my end, it doesn't work. So, I mean, right. I can continuously put videos out and it's funny because back there was a time when I had videos that were far lower quality than the ones I put out now. <laughs> and I could put those on a DVD, sell a DVD for 15 bucks and nobody thought about it. Everybody we was care. happy to buy it. We you care. I mean? <laughs> but you, you can't do that now. I mean, I can make far higher quality videos, but it doesn't matter. You still, these days, you just have to put it in somewhere on, on, to, on a cloud to stream yeah. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And if you want people to see it, you might have to pay for people to see it versus yes. it going the other way around. The other way, yes. You know? Isn't that, isn't that definitely bizarre that you got to pay? Yeah, I, kinda, I, I, resist, I, I have, I've caught myself resenting the idea that at some point I had spreadsheets full of names and addresses and emails that, 
that I fed into MySpace and, and then into Facebook and into some, you know, into other platforms mm -hmm. like YouTube so that all of my followers would be able to see my stuff that they then own all of that information yeah. and then block those people like yeah. Facebook or Instagram will block those same people from seeing you unless you pay to sponsor the video. Isn't that but I told you, you know, but I brought those people to you, you know, exactly. so it, it, it brings a little bit of resentment, but the game, as we've always said, since probably prior to uh, the end of slavery, <laughs> game is the game. And the, and the thing about people in general is people are survivors and ain't nobody better at surviving in my surmise than black people in America. Yeah, wow. Well, Talam, um, I have to, I, I hate to do it, but I know I don't mind, I don't mind paying, but <laughs> I know you got something, something in there that you could share. I'm always talking about how you are a great poet. I know people that are gonna be listening, like, where do I find him? What are you talking about? You know, is he gonna say something? I know you got something that you could share, you can leave with us. Um, uh, I don't sure. care what it is. I don't have it any is, music for you. <laughs> there is something about the way she conjures the ancestors. She, she dances when she walks like she's from the Congo, pure. Congo, like Asada Shakur says, brothers don't understand the science behind her self-reliance. She has a tattoo of Noble Drew on her neck and a tattoo of Marcus Garvey on her breast and says you've got to have the presence of Martin Delaney if you ever hope to have a future in getting past her Malcolm X. She is smooth as the Hennessy she's sipping as we listen to Horace Silver playing our third game of chess. And I can't help but stare into the natural texture of her hair as she compares George Padmore with C.L.R. James. And from there, she discusses Rodney's how Europe underdeveloped Africa and compares that to Kwame Nkrumah's neo-colonialism, the last stage of imperialism. And, and as her lips move, I get lost in her rhythm. And, and as her thoughts move, I get lost in her wisdom. Uh, I love it when she sings CCY2 to the children. I love when we go on vacations and she puts that homemade sign on the door that says, do not disturb nation building. She is Harriet Tubman. Loving her people with a passion, fashion like that last chapter in Carter G. Woodson's Miseducation of the Negro, we go conjure the ancestors after every port you reading, breathing life into the souls that surround us like New Orleans, constantly calling me back. I bathe her in compliments. I, I wrap her confidence around my waist. I, I taste her ancestors' DNA every night because there's something spiritual about swallowing the same flu as the once course the physical forms were predecessors of slaves and tribes and yo. Yo, you might think you know me, but if you ain't never seen me with her, then you ain't never seen me alive. I said, you might think you know me, but if you ain't never seen me with her, then you ain't never seen me alive. She goes from J.A. Rogers to a booba car with her heart beats the rhythm of the Haitian revolution and she dances to it singing the songs of the Cimarron colonies of San Salvador. And as she moves, there's something about the way she conjures the ancestors. There's something about the way she conjures my soul by day and by night. There is something about the way that she has conjured me back from the dead. There is something about the way that she conjures me continuously, y'all, back to life. That's that piece. Always, it is always a pleasure to hear that piece. <laughs> that is that piece. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, Talam, it is so good. Um, been so good catching up with you. I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed this time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, Thank you. It, it's always good to catch up with you. I I, uh, I will continue to follow you. I'll continue to follow you guys on your website uh, and I will pick that book up. Um, can you tell us one more time where we can find the book and um, if listeners want to follow you because after hearing that so I mean after hearing that um, piece I know they're going to be looking for more so uh, just tell us where the we can website find yeah the website is karmapoet.com so that's k-a-r-m-a-p-o-e-t karma poet dot com uh, you can see all the videos there you can get the book there you can find my instagram and facebook and all of that stuff right so um, mm -hmm. instagram is just uh, actually yeah it's talam ac but you can find it okay uh, will take you everywhere <laughs> okay perfect 
All right, Salam, again, I am grateful for this time. Um, I'm honored to have you in my space. Thank you for taking the time out for me. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you are gonna be doing next, okay? Thank you, I appreciate that, <laughs> Queenie, you take care. Yeah, so, um, so all right, listeners, this is your girl, Queenie. I am uh, gonna wrap this up. Thank you so much for listening and continue to be inspired and, to con and continue to inspire those that are around you. Um, and until next time, peace, love.